Hello class, this is your first of two installments on the autonomic nervous system. This will take some practice to get used to the reflex arcs of the autonomic nervous system that will be tested on. I will go through these in class as well as online, unless of course you are taking the hybrid class, in which case we will be doing all of these online together. As always, please reference your homework packet so you get an idea of exactly how I will be testing these on your upcoming lecture exam. The first thing to note when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system is that we're going to be dealing with a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. The preganglionic neuron, the soma, will always be in the CNS, always. The preganglionic axon is also called the fiber. The second neuron, soma, so the second soma, because we're dealing with a two neuron chain, so here's one, and here's two, will always be in the PNS, always. And the definition of a ganglion is a collection of neuronal cell bodies in the PNS. The second fiber, the postganglionic fiber, will terminate on your involuntary effectors. That includes smooth muscle, cardiac muscle glands, and adipose tissue. The first neuronal cell body will terminate on the second soma shown here. And the second soma is again in a ganglion. <clears throat> the autonomic nervous system is part of the nervous system. Specifically, today, we're going to be talking about the autonomic motor. This is where we're going to target our involuntary effectors. And for this lecture, we are only talking about the motor. So this is visceral motor, or efferent. Again, it will be a two-neuron chain. We will not worry about visceral sensory. If we want to compare somatic motor versus visceral motor systems, somatic nervous system involves a single neuron, and the soma is found in the CNS, specifically in the ventral gray horn of the spinal cord or in nuclei of cranial nerves that have somatic motor components. For example, cranial nerve 3, 4, 5, 6, I'm not doing Roman numerals even though I should, 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12. This neuronal fiber will exit through ventral rootlets, enter into a spinal nerve, then take either an anterior or posterior primary ramus, and will synapse on skeletal muscle fibers. This would be example, this whole thing would be an example of a motor unit. And I'll remind you from a previous lecture unit, a motor unit is a somatic motor neuron and all of the skeletal muscle fibers it innervates. In contrast, the autonomic nervous system is going to deal with a two neuron chain. The first cell body will always be found in the CNS, either in nuclei or in a lateral gray horn, sometimes called lateral gray column, 
in the spinal cord, and the second neuronal cell body is always found in a ganglion. The first fiber will terminate on the second cell body, always, and the second fiber will terminate on your involuntary effectors. Smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, and in a special case, adipose tissue. As always, your textbook has a very good way of grouping this information into a table form should you want to make this into a flashcard. So I'm not going to go through the entire table, but excuse me, it highlights all of the information that I just went through. The autonomic nervous system has two main divisions. They are going to be innervating many of the same <clears throat> involuntary, effect, involuntary effectors, but not always. And they will definitely have different actions. The parasympathetic division is mostly in control when you're resting and digesting. And sometimes we say peeing and reading. And it's called craniosacral in origin, mainly because it comes from the preganglionic fiber. You say cranial sacral in origin. Preganglionic cell body is found in nuclei of cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, and in a lateral gray column called the sacral lateral gray column at levels S2, S3, and S4. So all of that is shown here for parasympathetic division. The sympathetic division is in charge of your four Fs, flight, flight, freeze, and fornication. It is called thoracolumbar in origin because, again, the preganglionic fiber cell body is found in the intermedial lateral cell column. That is a fancy way of saying a lateral gray column at levels T1 through L2. <clears throat> again, fight, flight, freeze, and fornication. What are some common characteristics of both the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions? They both use a two-neuron chain, a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron. They both will use what's referred to as a way station. That means the first neuron is going to terminate, that's what we mean by making a connection, or synapse, onto the postganglionic neuron. In both divisions, the first neuron will always release acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. So this neuron would release acetylcholine onto the soma of the postganglionic cell body. And in the sympathetic division, we would also see acetylcholine released onto the soma of the postganglionic neuron. <clears throat> so this is some comparisons between the parasympathetic and sympathetic division. They have different, so this is where they're differing, they have different functions. One is engaged in your resting moments and the other one is more engaged in your fight or flight response. Where they are found is very different. Again, the parasympathetic is called cranio, cranial sacral because of its origin, and the sympathetic is called thoracolumbar because of where we find the preganglionic cell bodies. Where do we find the postganglionic cell bodies? Well, that will also be different. For the parasympathetic, we will find them in terminal ganglia. That is the term I use. And for the sympathetic division, we will find them either in sympathetic trunk ganglia 
also known as paravertebral, or in prevertebral ganglia, also known as collateral. Do not worry about the axons, but do pay attention to the length of the pre- and postganglionic axons. Notice that they are inversely related to the two divisions. Again, where do we find the location of the ganglia, terminal ganglia for parasympathetic division? Sympathetic trunk, also known as paravertebral ganglia, or prevertebral, also known as collateral, and those are found on major blood vessels, and I'll show you a picture of that soon. So the collateral or prevertebral are found on major blood vessels in the abdominal cavity. Location of the preganglionic cell bodies, parasympathetic, we find them in the cranial nuclei, as I've already mentioned, in the sacral lateral gray column. That's from S2 to S4. And for the sympathetic, we find it in a special lateral gray column called the IMLCC. It stands for Intermediolateral Cell Column, and that's thoracolumbar T1 through L2. So more differences between the sympathetic and parasympathetic division. Again, I've already referred to the size of their axons for both the pre- and post-ganglionic neuron. Where do we find the ganglia? That means the second neuronal cell body, either in the sympathetic trunk ganglia or pre-vertebral ganglia. Sympathetic trunk ganglia are also called paravertebral, as you saw in the previous slide. Prevertebral are also called collateral. And those are going to be found on major blood vessels in the abdominal cavity, and we will name those major blood vessels in just a moment. Parasympathetic division, as you saw in the previous slide, will the, the postganglionic cell bodies are found in terminal ganglia. Those are in the body, those sorry, those are in the wall of the involuntary effector. What do I mean by that? If you go back and review your anatomy of the heart, you remember that the heart had three layers. There was the endo, the myo, which was the muscle part of the heart, and then the top cover was the epicardium, so endocardium, myocardium, epicardium. And if you wanted to know where the the cell bodies are for the parasympathetic division that innervate the heart, the postganglionic cell bodies, would be found just underneath the epicardium. That's what I mean by in the wall of the involuntary effector. Another difference is the type of neurotransmitter that the second neuron releases. In the parasympathetic division, it will still be acetylcholine. So both neurons release acetylcholine. I remember this by A, A. Those are the first two vowels in the word parasympathetic for acetylcholine, acetylcholine. In the sympathetic division, we see acetylcholine released by the first neuron. But what about the second one? Most notably, it's going to be epinephrine, epinephrine or norepinephrine. Those are chemically different. But for us in anatomy, you have license to interchange those terms. In physiology and in pharmacology, you will learn that they are most certainly different and they even target different receptors. But for us in anatomy, just learning, we can use epinephrine and norepinephrine interchangeably. Epinephrine is also called adrenaline and norepinephrine is called noradrenaline. I'm just gonna abbreviate it here because I'm running out of space. The parasympathetic division, again, we find the preganglionic neurons in cranial nuclei for three, seven, nine, and 10, shown here, three, seven, nine, and 10. All of those are preganglionic fibers 
We also find sacral chord equivalents, as you might be reading in your homework packet. And all of those are going to terminate on terminal ganglia. So that's how I'm going to refer to them in our class and in your homework packet. Cranial nerve 3 with its postganglionic neuron will target your lacrimal gland and also it's going to target the um, ciliary body. And that is important for your up close vision, also known as accommodation. Cranial nerve number seven. Cranial nerve number seven is going to be, um, sorry, let me strike that and redo. Cranial nerve three is going to go to your ciliary body in your in the um, part of the vascular tunic of the eye. Cranial nerve seven goes to the lacrimal gland with its postganglionic partner. Got ahead of myself there. Cranial nerve nine will terminate on a postganglionic neuron that will innervate the parotid gland and the subling sublingual. So those two salivary glands are cranial nerve nine. Another cranial nerve, the submandibular gland, is going to be innervated by cranial nerve number seven. Then lastly, so that was cranial nerve seven here, cranial nerve nine, you can see this going to the parotid and it also goes to the sublingual, but cranial nerve seven goes to the submandibular. Cranial nerve 10 is regarded as the parasympathetic division by physiologists because it extends all the way into the thoracic cavity to target the heart with its postganglionic partner, the lungs again with its postganglionic partner, and most of the viscera that are found in the abdominal cavity. Again, notice that cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10 all terminate on a postganglionic neuron shown here in light blue. The sacral equivalents are going to target organs that developed in your pelvic bowl, most notably the bladder and the uterus in the case uh, in vagina, in the case of females the penis in the case of males. And again, notice that they terminate on a postganglionic fiber shown here in light blue. Again, here is a, um, a chart showing you how these preganglionic fibers from the cranial nerves, again, they are preganglionic. They are going to have to terminate on postganglionic cell bodies these are all going to be referred to as terminal ganglia for me. Again, cranial nerve is important for the ciliary body for accommodation. Cranial nerve seven is going to target the lacrimal gland and submandibular sublingual. So I need to correct that. I thought, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. I made a mistake, I said sublingual is cranial nerve nine. That picture made it look like that and I should know better. Cranial nerve nine only innervates the parotid gland. So again, just to correct from the first slide so I don't have to start all over again. Parotid gland. Cranial nerve seven is gonna get the other two along with the lacrimal. So let me fix that here and go back just a moment. Cranial nerve nine, parotid. Cranial nerve seven, lacrimal. And the subs, lingual, mandibular. And then cranial nerve 10, just to come back, is going to target the thoracic involuntary effectors and many of the abdominal. <coughs> and the pelvic splanchnic equivalents from S2, S3, S4 are going to target the viscera that were developing, most of the viscera, in the pelvic bowl. In contrast, the sympathetic division 
historical lumbar and origin, that's where we find the preganglionic cell bodies in the intermedial lateral cell column, which is a specific name for a lateral gray column found at these levels. It's going to, those preganglionic fibers are going to terminate on the sympathetic trunk ganglia. That's shown here and on the other side. You can see these on your cats in lab. Or they're going to terminate on prevertebral ganglia that are found on major blood vessels in the abdominal cavity. These are the celiac ganglion, superior mesenteric ganglion, and inferior mesenteric ganglion. Those are also called collateral. So I'm frequently making a joke saying there are two names for everything in anatomy except for when there's seven. It's a joke. So paravertebral is a generic term for ganglia found in the abdominal cavity. Sorry, that's prevertebral. I'm reading the wrong thing. Prevertebral found in the abdominal cavity also referred to as collateral ganglia. And then specifically, here are the names of the three that I want you to know. Here is a picture showing you the sympathetic trunk. And all of these expanded regions here are the sympathetic ganglia that are called paravertebral ganglia. Para means next to, so it's next to the vertebral column next to paravertebral. <clears throat> and in the next segment, you're going to learn about your sympathetic pathways. And this is also in your homework packet. And there were about four supplements that I uploaded on Canvas. One of them is a supplement on the sympathetic pathways. There are many options that the fibers can use. There are options for the preganglionic fiber. There are options for the postganglionic options. And we're going to go through all of these options, and you should be ready for them. Options are merely pathways. And my best analogy for this is to ask you, are there several ways for you to get home from school? Could you take the freeway? Could you take surface streets? <clears throat> Can you take Crown Valley Parkway? Could you take Alton Parkway? I mean, I'm sure you have at least four different or five different ways you can get to your house. Think of all these options as different ways for us to go from the spinal cord to the involuntary effector. And the involuntary effector would be your house, the destination. <clears throat> so again, these pathways are shown to you in um, your textbook. And we're going to go through them individually. We're going to cover the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. Um, when we cover the pathways for the parasympathetic divisions, the ones that are going to viscera in the abdominal cavity and pelvic bowl, coming off of the, the sacral spinal cord, S2 to S4. Um, those are very specific pathways, and they're going to use something called a splanchnic nerve, a pelvic splanchnic nerve, and I'll explain what that is in just a moment. So here is a pelvic splanchnic nerve. And we are going to have those pelvic splanchnic nerves terminate on terminal ganglia, just so we don't get things confused. And for the sympathetic division, we're going to see options for the pre pathways, options, and options for the post as well. So there will be an exception when we actually cover our sympathetic division. The, and I'll, I'll do that right now. There's an exception, or what appears to be an exception, to the two-neuron rule. And that is when we are terminating on the adrenal medulla. So if you look carefully at this picture, 
you're seeing a preganglionic fiber entering the spinal nerve. Then it enters a white communicating ramus. So that's our entrance. So it enters, it goes through the sympathetic ganglia and enters a splanchnic nerve. The definition of a splanchnic nerve is a nerve that has preganglionic fibers. So there are splanchnic nerves for the sympathetic division, and you will see there are splanchnic nerves for the parasympathetic division. This splanchnic nerve terminates on the adrenal medulla, which is a gland. And you might say, well, Kara, you said that we would have to have a two neuron chain, and here is the first neuron directly synapsing on the involuntary effector. However, you should know that the adrenal medulla is actually modified neurons. And the cells in the adrenal medulla in here are called chromaffin cells. They are modified neurons. So the adrenal medulla represents the postganglionic cells. And those cells, those modified postganglionic cells, those modified neurons, are going to release epinephrine into the bloodstream, where now epinephrine is acting as a hormone. I'm just going to go back a little bit here. One slide. And I want you to see that we're going to have some options again for the preganglionic fiber and the postganglionic fiber. And when we, st when we study the sympathetic division and when we study the parasympathetic division, specifically the sacral equivalents, those are also going to have some options. We're going to see a pelvic splanchnic nerve. Whenever you read pelvic splanchnic, I want you to think parasympathetic for us, for testing purposes. And it's a preganglionic fiber. It will terminate on terminal ganglia. All right, that concludes our first segment for this lecture.